Hello again, everybody, and welcome to The Warrior Report here on HBC TV 25. I'm Justin Barrientos. Thank you for joining us. We are brought to you by Russell and Associates and coming to you from the 111 Riverfront building in downtown Winona. And it's time once again to kind of get a preview of the season for Warrior football. Head coach Brian Bergstrom joins us, and we haven't seen you since the spring game uh, back in April, but uh, thanks for joining us here today and kind of giving us a, a season preview of Warrior football. Yeah, you bet. Love being here. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, we talked in the spring kind of of a wrap up of last season, but uh, just in case people uh, didn't see that, you guys had a great year last year, your first year as head coach, eight and four overall. And so now you kind of head into your second season of um, you know the camp and trying to figure out what the team is like. So kind of give us that wrap up of what the end of the year was like and, and this off season heading into training camp. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, it's a 365 day uh, a year job for coaches and then uh, same for the players. Mm -hmm. And there's breaks in there certainly, but uh, ever since the spring game, uh, their mindset shifted into summer training uh, and into fall camp. And they get a little bit of a break after finals and then uh, where they can go home. And then uh, we had a huge majority of the team here all summer long. Uh, which is critical in our mm -hmm. success, training with our strength and conditioning staff and, and both lifting and running and, and uh, also kind of doing some captain's practices on their own. Coaches aren't out on the field with them or we don't have normal practices in the summer until uh, fall camp, which started two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've been at it ever since then. And, and, uh, and that's football all the time for, for two weeks. And uh, that is very much would look like a football practice when you're out there with the coaches. And then today's the first day of school, you know. So yeah. it's, uh, it, it's, it's cool because there's different calendars throughout the year, but our guys have worked very hard and excited to get to games soon. You know, we, we talk about this all the time, and, and this may be difficult to answer, but in those spring practices and even the spring game, even though that's just a brief snapshot, did anybody kind of play their way into consideration uh, for more playing time this year from what you saw in the spring heading into summer camp? I think what's cool to see is uh, is the whole kind of younger couple classes. And, uh, and I'll highlight the freshman class from last year. You go through a whole year, and um, most of them were redshirted. We didn't redshirt one. And so their their day-to-day -day is very different in football. And when you get to really right when the season's done, you're not a red shirt anymore, hmm. and you're you're competing to play, and that starts in winter conditioning. Um, so I would say that that class did an amazing job from the end of last season uh, until now uh, of getting themselves ready to compete. And you'll see you'll see a number of them out there uh, playing this year. All right. Um, so let's talk about the summer then. Um, how was that kind of structured, and uh, what was what was camp like uh, in the previous weeks? Mm -hmm. So we start summer training at the beginning of June with our strength staff. Coach Hodges and, and his staff, uh, they, they would strength train four times a week with him and they would have an option of going in the morning, early in the morning, or late afternoon based off of their work schedule. And, but the whole team would then run together after the, the afternoon lift. So some of the guys would go work out in the weight room in the morning, go to work all day, come back, in the evening and run together uh, out on the field. And if they're a guy that lifted in the afternoon, they would go right from the lift to the to the running. Uh, and then a couple days a week, they would do some cap practices, player-led. Um, Coach Hodges um, you know, wasn't leading that. It was the leaders, DBs getting into some DB drills, quarterbacks you know, throwing passes to the receivers. And that really helps with leadership and, and helps them lead their own football team because it's not the coach's team, it's their team. And then they get a little time off over the 4th of July, a little time off over right before camp starts. And then uh, August 6th, we started fall camp. And then from there, their life is very different. It's, it's wake up and have meetings and practice and eat and break, strength train, meetings, walkthroughs, just over and over and over for really 14 days. And uh, here we are now. So it really is kind of, you know, all football centric uh, for these players then, as you said, um, you know, now that they kind of transition into the, the camp and, and this mentality. Um, how much do you think that that 
bonds everybody together and, and kind of forms this, this football family that we talk about all the time. Well, that's huge. Time is critical in their ability to know each other, trust each other, love each other. And fall camp is one of the best times for that. They spend a lot of time year round together, but fall camp is one of those where you're with the same 115 guys for two straight weeks. And you obviously have your friends or the guys you're closer with on the team. Uh, but an exciting time where you're welcoming a bunch of new freshmen too or, or transfers that uh, are coming into the family. So that time is critical because it's the amount of time, but it's also the hard things you do together. You're doing challenging things together and, and also fun things together, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, like throughout fall camp, it wasn't all football all the time. It, there was breaks, there was surprise nights off. There was meals together, there was community service together, there was going bowling together. So um, all of those things help you grow a closer team. All right, let's talk a little bit about community service because I know in the past, like helping out with Ashley for the Arts and, and helping out kind of around the community are, are different things that have been hallmarks of this Warrior football program for years. Uh, what were some of the things that the, the team did this year? Yeah, so we, the biggest thing isn't just one certain cause and the, the causes that we're a part of are awesome. It's not about one thing. It's about getting our guys to understand that the world is more than them. It's more than their circle. It's more than our team. And it's to get them to look outside themselves and to try and do something for somebody that can never pay them back and they know it going in. Mm -hmm. And um, so like during fall camp, we again helped out at Ashley for the Arts. It's such a cool event for the, this local area and be going and we got a lot of manpower to help clean up after the event uh, but then during the year uh, we have a lot of opportunities some of them are the whole team some of them will say we will say we need five volunteers for this and we'll have guys step up and whether it's in the in the school system with the reading program or the uh, mentoring program or helping out at recess uh, we're, we're a big part of uh, be the match which is a national bone marrow registry uh, drive where we host one on campus. Uh, and those are just, just a few. It's pretty much all year long there's opportunities. All right. Uh, one of the other things I want to talk about is something I saw on social media uh, during the summer is you brought in a lot of guest speakers and kind of guests into camp, which included you know, former coach Tom Sawyer, Connie Mattil, uh, Greg Jones, the softball mm -hmm. coach. Um, what did you uh, what did you expect to get from them and what did you get from them as they had their message mm -hmm. for the team? Well, that's one of my favorite parts of the day. We end every day after our night walk through with a guest speaker. And it, you know, is anywhere from three minutes to 15 minutes. And that's kind of up to the person. And we bring in a wide variety. You mentioned, you know, Coach Sawyer or other coaches or, you know, President Jans was, was our speaker mm -hmm. last week. And it's people from outside the university as well. It's not all internal, it's alumni sometimes. And what we're trying to what we're trying to provide there is a is a perspective of how big uh, their impact is as a football team and how big their uh, impact is as a football player, but also the long tradition at Winona mm -hmm. State and how it's gonna be here long after they leave. And it's their job to be a good steward of the program and leave it better than you found it. And sometimes they get sick of hearing me talk or the coaches talk, <laughs> bring in somebody else that can maybe give a very similar message about something. Uh, and I, le I really do leave it up to them when they come in and they can share from their heart about uh, what the team means to them and some encouragement for them. And um, that's some of my highlights of camp. I, I know that on one of the posts you talked about taking notes as Coach Jones from the softball program uh, was talking and that seemed a little odd, but at the same time, you're all college coaches, you're all coaching a sport, mm -hmm. so it, it's similar even though the sports are different. What are some of the things that you picked up from Coach Jones? Well, I think uh, he was speaking uh, in terms of you know being a competitor and what it takes. It had nothing to do with what sport it was. And I think the thing that stood out the most, and I literally was jotting things down the whole time, and um, was he talked about love precedes grit. And love, we feel, is our greatest motivator. It's not fear. Uh, they're both, they're both, uh, they both motivate love and fear. But we we believe that love is a stronger acting one and longer lasting. And 
Um, so we talk about that a lot as a program. And then our, our mantra and our culture is grit, growth, and team. So those two things stuck out, but I hadn't, I hadn't heard it phrased that way, that in order to truly fight through things, whether that's physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, whatever it is, and keep getting back up with endurance and perseverance, that's grit. Uh, but in order to do that, you have to love it or love someone in it or the process or because we love our families we're willing to go through hard things with our with our own families and mm -hmm. because we love the sport of football and our team and you know the pursuit of the prize at the end we're going to go through hard things together but if you truly don't love it if you just kind of like it uh, or you're not going to have you're not going to have the ability to keep fighting through and that was probably the biggest thing that stood out to me all right. Now, obviously, you've been in this game a long time as a player, uh, as a coach, a position coach, and just a, a regular coach, and now mm -hmm. uh, second year as head coach. How has the approach to summer camp, fall camp, you know, all these different things, how has it changed from when you played mm -hmm. to where you are now? Yeah, well, there's a lot of differences, and a lot of them have to do with how you, the best way to prepare for football. And they've, the NCAA has made a lot of changes in terms of protecting players and practicing in a smart way. And I think they've all been really good. We practice different now than we did when I played, mm -hmm. you know, 20 years ago. And it was, it used, I, I feel, it used to be a, a, just about sheer uh, physical toughness of your ability to do that over long stretches of time, where there was two a days and three a days of full practices and no limits to contact within a practice. Now there's very specific rules for how much you can hit and whether you can tackle to the ground and what pads you can wear and how quickly you can go full pads and you can't have two a days anymore and 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 I would agree and I would say that we as a staff were about quality over quantity and so we want to be very intentional with how we practice we want to be very efficient and calculate with and do it with really 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 high effort so we train our guys to play full speed and, and do it but do it in a safe way because you're not you're not asking them to run a marathon every day also, right? You're just asking them to go really, really hard when we're here. We're gonna take care of your bodies, uh, but go hard. And um, I think it, it, it didn't used to be that way. And probably early in my career, I probably thought more how I was trained. Yeah. And this is just a better way to do it. So I'm guessing then it's not a very difficult switch to as a mentality, as a player, and now that you're in charge, to be able to adapt to the changes and adapt to a different way of coaching? No, I think, I think it's been gradual over time. Part of it, I think, is my maturity and wisdom and, well, what is it going to take? And, and I am now of the approach to, like, minimal dosage. Like, if you pres prescribed medication by the doctor, they're probably, they want to give you the minimum amount and still get the, the, the greatest result. Mm -hmm. At some point, taking more of the pills isn't going to help anymore. So at some point, more periods of practice isn't going to help anymore. And every period we're able to cut out but still have the maximal benefit, we're cutting out risk of injury. And one of my main goals in fall camp, I have three of them, but one of my main goals is to be a healthy, fast football team that plays physical on August 31st. And in order to do that, you have to be a healthy football team. you got to train, uh, but you you got to have your guys ready to go. Uh, and the other two are... Uh, being a, a more mentally strong football team, being able to have a greater capacity with how we think and our emotions and how we control them in the game and how we use them to our advantage. And then the other uh, fall camp goal I, I had uh, is become a more player-led team. Uh, and I think we've knocked it out of the park with all three of those. All right, very good. Well, we're going to take a break here on the Warrior Report. And when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more, get into more specifics with uh, Warrior football as we head into the 2023 season. Let's right after this. For over 60 years, Russell & Associates has been helping individual and business clients achieve what matters to them. Our trusted advisors have the expertise and experience to help with long-term plans for personal finance, business finance, or wealth management. Focus on what matters most. Call Russell & Associates Certified Public Accountants and Advisors today at 507-452-3100 or visit us online at russellcpafirm.com. Meet Jenny Soseski of Adina Realty. With nearly 30 years experience, she knows that right now is the best time to sell your home. Jenny will help you get top dollar, 
higher than ever before. With today's low interest rates, it's time to upgrade your home and increase its value. High demand and low inventory also make this a perfect time to list your home. Call for a free market analysis. Contact Jenny Sosesky at Adina Realty today, 507-458-7038. And welcome back to the Warrior Report here on HBC TV 25. We are brought to you by Russell & Associates, coming to you from the 111 Riverfront Building, the Latch Development Center in downtown Winona. You're kind of talking about a, a player-led team is kind of how you want to uh, approach some facets of the game. And, and with that, you've named four captains um, already for this season, uh, Clay Scheffner, Joe Demro, Tyler Zerpoli, and Jordan Haddad. Uh, tell us a little bit about the selection of the captains and, and what you expect from those mm -hmm. players. Well, I believe in allowing the team to pick their representation. And so we voted for captains, or the team voted for captains, uh, the first, after the first week of fall camp. We did not have the freshman vote just because it felt like they weren't around long enough mm -hmm. to know. And, uh, but the, the, the rest of the team certainly had an opportunity to gauge their uh, opinion of who would be the best leaders. And we don't prescribe that it has to be a certain amount. I'm okay with anywhere from three to six captains based off of the voting. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be two offense, two defense. Uh, it could be a specialist some years. And uh, this year it happened to be two offense, two defense. And it's, it's a good problem to have where you have a lot of guys in the mix. Mm -hmm. A lot of And that's why we have a leadership council as well, another layer of, uh, of 14 other guys. Because when you're leading 115 people, you need, you need manpower to lead. Yeah. So uh, I think the guys you know picked with incredible wisdom in terms of the leadership with with clay scheffner joe demro tyler zerpoli and then uh jordan haddad and they uh were were far and away uh very strong leaders going in and i knew that uh but they they certainly voted the team voted that way as well and we put a lot on them uh when when someone gets put into a leadership role they got to understand that that's a that's a, that's a position, mm -hmm. but leadership is much more than a position. Just being in the position doesn't make you a great leader. You cannot have the position and be a better leader, and so they they but they are going to be held to a higher standard. Just like seniors are held to a higher standard, our leadership council will be held to a higher standard. The captains are are held to the highest standard where they have all eyes on them, and they're in essence part of the coaching staff in a way because they're. Them and the leadership council are a bridge between the team and the staff and create good, good conversations. And I want to know what they think, and I want to know what they think is best for the team. So that's the first place I go for what's the, what's the pulse of the team here. And uh, they've been doing a great job. All right. Uh, you also mentioned that you know you're going to have 11 players that are going to be playing their last year of college football. And we're kind of staying away from the term senior because with the COVID year, you know, some people have different levels of, of oh, do I get an extra year coming mm -hmm. back? And I think we're almost ready to kind of phase that out. Maybe there's one or two more years where people are going to have five years uh, to play in college football. Um, but what's it like to have that particular number? It sounds like a little bit of a low number, but, you know, you got 22 players that, mm -hmm. are, that are on the field that, that play. Uh, tell us a little bit about that group of senior leadership. Well, that, that's another layer of leadership is mm -hmm. the seniors and you know in terms of the the amount of work that they've put in and sometimes four sometimes five mm -hmm. sometimes six years uh it's, it's just incredible so they're a group that certainly um i lean on and cheer for and root for i mean you do for the whole team but they're just a group you feel close with in their last year because football is such a special game mm -hmm. And when it's done, usually it's done. You're not playing pickup football, you know, like you can some other sports. And it, it's a hard thing. So everything they do this year will kind of be the last. It's the last fall camp. It's the last first game. And, and it's going to fly by. And um, so super excited for them and the role that they're going to play, whether it's a bunch on the field, some on the field, very little on the field. Uh, they're in for a, a ride that's going to be a ton of fun and, and appreciate all the time they've put in so far. All right. Uh, I want to talk about uh, polls. And I know that, you know, at this point, the, the preseason poll, it matters, it doesn't matter. But in the NSIC, you're picked to finish sixth. But you've also received votes in the national poll, which tells me 
at the NSIC is going to be a very difficult conference, maybe one of the best in Division II. Do you kind of share that same sentiment? Yeah, I think I've, I know we're a very competitive league, and there's a bunch of teams that a bounce of the ball here, a bounce of the ball there, can win games or lose games. And I don't get too caught up in preseason uh, polls because it's just people guessing, and usually people guessing that don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so it, the, it's, uh, I haven't even not once brought it up to our staff, uh, certainly the team. I think sometimes by bringing it up and saying don't, don't listen to it, uh, you draw attention to it. And if it's not important, let's not talk about it. Mm -hmm. And now, end of the season rankings, end of the season results, we'll talk about those because that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, but in reality, we got zero control over all of it. So uh, beyond just focusing on getting better every day, I don't want our guys dwelling on it. Uh, if there's a little piece of them that's motivated by seeing it, fine. <laughs> but I'm not going to make a huge deal of it. All right. Uh, I want to move on to talk about uh, some of the coaches, coaching staff that uh, made changes. You brought in a couple of coaches. You kind of shifted some duties of other yeah. coaches. Uh, let's talk about that. Uh, Bryce Cross, uh, Trey Johnson, and Mitch Fair have all joined the staff this year. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you expect from them? Well, one, they're, they're awesome men, and they're awesome young men. And um, they're, that's, that's priority number one for me when we hire someone is, is who they are and their character. Because you, can't, you can teach certain things about Winona State or the defense or offense that we run, but it's really, really hard to teach them how to be a good person and to be loyal and to work hard and to be on time and, and all of those things. Now, can we impact them? Yeah, uh, but you wanna hire that and then train them for, you know, train them for the skill that they're gonna be working in. And Coach Fair is, is our defensive line coach and came to us from uh, Bowling Green and um, has done a great job uh, because Coach Erickson moved from defensive line into linebackers to coordinate the defense and along with him is, is Trey Johnson uh, assistant defensive line who came to us from Colorado State and they they make a great team with our D-line that's a lot of guys it's like 20 guys in the D-line so that's a lot of a lot of bodies a lot of energy a lot of egos a lot of um, you know, a lot of talk um, so th they've done a great job of mentoring them and uh, and then lastly, Bryce Cross uh, with, with our running backs. Recently got done playing at Western Illinois, played DB. Um, but when someone is relational, has high energy, is a good teacher, uh, they can learn how to coach running backs. So he's coaching our running backs and, and has really picked up on it very quickly and formed a tight bond with that room. And I think all three of them match what we're looking for. I talked about before their character and who they are. Uh, that helps them be a great mentor to our guys. They're not a, they're not a f best friend. A coach is different than a friend. You're their coach. And that's a mentor, teacher. We got to be great teachers and take a complicated game and make it simple. And then be a master of your craft, so to speak, of all the skills, and then a great motivator. Uh, you got to be able to push the buttons individually of each player and the group. And that's easier said than done. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of took a look at, at you know, who was returning from last season, uh, who departed, uh, you know, some of the players that you added then as well, because I think there was uh, 33 that uh, you got from signing day. Um, as, as you look at your team through this uh, fall camp, what are some of the positions you think that maybe need to develop a little bit more that maybe you lost a little bit from um, that, that need a little bit more work here during yeah. the training camp? Well, I think you look at when you lose somebody, you're always, especially if they're a good player, you're like, man, how are we ever going to replace them? Mm -hmm. And then every year you replace them, you know? <laughs> and, and I think every program feels that way. In terms of where you might see the most new faces because of that, I, I think of our defensive line. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, lost, um, we lost some key players there that played a lot of football. And fortunately, we're very deep in the defensive line and we rotate a bunch of guys. So a, a lot of the guys playing this year, um, you'll recognize their name. Uh, receiver is a spot that we, we lost a number of guys, uh, but a ton of young guys stepping up. We had a few transfers at that uh, position group as well. And then um, offensive line is another one where you, it requires so many people and we lost some and you, you have some injuries here and you, uh, offensive line is the most important that, that you're you, like in sync with. It's mm -hmm. incredibly physical, but it's like a dance. You gotta be step by step with each other. And um, so 
I think it's exciting time because you see guys step into new roles and go do what they've trained themselves to do. Yeah, I think when uh, offensive line, uh, one of the names that jumps out that you lost to graduation is Joe Carlson, mm -hmm. uh, who was there for a long time, played really well on that offensive line. But as you said, it's kind of that next player up. How long, and, and this is one of the things we talk about all the time, how long does it take to develop that bond on the offensive line? Because as you said, that's a very important part of, of moving the mm -hmm. offense is getting that line together. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it takes all positions, but certainly the O-line, because there is five of them. Mm -hmm. And I would say they, they need to be more step-by-step -step than maybe a D-line does. I think D-line needs to play together, certainly. But many times they're doing different, maybe a different stunt on this side or a different technique based off what was going on that side, where typically the whole offensive line is in unison in whatever the scheme is. And it takes time. And it, it, it can't just be built during the season. That's why the off-season time is so important. Um, but I will say that the O-line and the D-line seem to have the most fun, like playing football, but also just being together. Like you walk into their meeting rooms before a meeting, it's, it's just a different vibe and a different, uh, a different <laughs> feel than some of the, like going into a quarterback meeting. And, and I think that's how it should be. They, they do a good job of that. And, and Coach Olson does a good job of that with the O-line. And then Coach Fair and Coach Johnson uh, do now. Coach Erickson did last year. Mm -hmm. I just think you got to build a culture in there where they can be themselves. No one it's time to work mm -hmm. and no one it's time to have fun because I think champions are able to toe that line very well and play loose, have fun, but be incredibly focused when you need to be. All right. I don't necessarily want you to tip your hat here as you're uh, a week and a half away from your first game, but how do you see the offense going? Do you see it? As kind of a 50-50, do you think you'll be more heavy on run, more heavy on pass? We'll be pretty balanced. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's our, our intent all the time. And if that's what you're shooting for, it doesn't mean that every time, every game, that's what it's going to take. We, we have to do what it's going to take that game. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's more run, sometimes it's more pass, sometimes it's the situation. Uh, but you'll see a balanced attack from a run pass, and we try to spread the ball out to our best players and not just be giving it to one person. So um, I'm excited. The offense, both sides have made tremendous growth, but um, from, from the day we walked in here, our goal has been to just be better today than we were yesterday. And don't worry about the end. The end will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. Last year, we didn't worry about Bemidji in the playoffs when it was week one. We yeah. worried about beating Minot State. And when you add it all up and stack it all up, then you look back and say, well, this is what we did. All right, we got about a minute and a half left here. so. Kind of last question, I think. How does um, the, the tempo, the mood change as you get into preparation for week one of the season compared to what fall camp was prior? I think it becomes more urgent. A uh, couple of reasons. One, because the game is closer. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we're like 10 days away mm -hmm. uh, at this point. And uh, the other is you have less time each day. So everything you do is magnified that much more because you're not in fall camp anymore. Mm -hmm. You're not practicing all day. You don't have another meeting today. You got one and we got to get it done now. And that's why when it becomes that important that they, they're going to go back to their, how they've been trained. So they're not going to rise to the occasion. They're going to sink to the level of, that they were trained. So that's why all year long, we're always urgent. We're always pushing in to say this is how it needs to be done now because when it's really important, that's not when you want to train yourself. Yeah. All right. Thursday, August 31st is the first game. You'll be on the road at Saginaw Valley State. We'll kind of get into that a little bit more uh, next week uh, when we talk to you again with Coach Bergstrom. Thanks for joining us here today and kind of giving us a season preview of you Warrior bet. Football. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you for watching here on the Warrior Report. We'll see you next week here on HBC TV 25.